So hi everyone, and uh, welcome to Sailing with MongoDB. My name is Christina Chattero, and let me just get this set up. Okay. So um, before I get started, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, I just finished writing with my coworker, Mike Duroff, MongoDB, The Definitive Guide, and uh, it's coming out, I think, next week, according to Amazon, and the ebook is already available, and apparently I'm going to get my copy today, which should be really cool. Uh, so I'm really excited for that, and um, I'm... I, I wrote and maintain the PHP driver for Mongo. I maintain the Perl driver, and I just generally do a thousand little things all around the project and the peripheral projects around MongoDB. So Mike and I have been working on Mongo for the last uh, two and a half years now and uh, helping users with it since nearly the beginning. So the book is sort of a culmination of helping all these users and answering their questions for a couple of years. And so hopefully people will find it useful. And I encourage you all to check it out. Man, the slide changing is really slow. And also, I am unfortunately sick today. So if I'm talking in a complete monotone the whole time, I, I'm going to try not to. But I might. And I might sneeze and deafen you all. So hopefully that won't happen. Um, but it's probably worse for my boss than it is for you because I'm borrowing his headset mic. But hopefully I just won't sneeze. Um, so if you're doing an application, you are going to have some sort of uh, database in the back end storing your data. And that application is going to have some balance of the number of reads it has to handle to the number of writes it has to handle. So most applications that people do are read heavy. You're going to have a lot more reads than you have writes. It's easier to um, read a blog post than it is to write it or read your friend's status messages than it is to write your own. So uh, there are some exceptions to that, especially auto-collected data, sensor data, uh, getting zillions of GPS signals from cell phones that are write heavy. But a lot of applications are read heavy. And there's a great solution to scaling for just reads, which is replication. You start out with one database that handles all the writes and reads. And then as you need more reads, you can add slaves, which have an identical copy of the data to the master. Um, but you can do reads from those. So you can send all your writes to the master. And then um, you can send a much greater number of reads to the slaves uh, and just keep adding slaves as you need more reads. So uh, then the other benefit of having the master-slave thing is that you can minimize downtime uh, by having these slaves. Um, if you have, say, um, like a, a server prod one, and then it has a slave prod two, then you can, um, oh, I'll put a little hat on the master just to uh, make it clear who the master is. But uh, if, you, if prod1 goes down, then you can bring up prod2 as the new master. Um, the thing is that if prod1 goes down in the middle of the night, you have to wake up at like 2 AM, um, figure out what's going on, then uh, make prod2 a master, and then switch your application over, which is all kind of a pain to do at like 2 in the morning. So uh, what Mongo did was try to improve this process a bit by creating this thing called replica sets. So replica sets are pretty much master-slave setup. You've got your master, prod1, and then it's got slave, prod2, with an identical copy of the data on it. Um, that way, and the only difference here, really, is that it, uh, the client knows about both prod1 and prod2, um, but it's just not using the connection to prod2 yet. So if prod1 goes down, then um, prod2 can be like, huh, I wonder what happened there. and, and um, the, these, uh, these servers send out heartbeats. So prod2 will realize, um, oh, I didn't get a heartbeat. Maybe it's dead. Um, and it'll wait for a few seconds in case it was just a network error. But then it will assume mastership. And it'll, 
I'll say, okay, I'm the new master. I can now handle uh, writes. And uh, since the client knows about both of them, uh, your application can just switch over to the new master and uh, start sending writes to that one. Um, and so you might have a couple seconds where you can't do writes, but your application just can just automatically switch over. The servers can automatically switch, and everything is automatic. And um, you it'll just start sending writes to the new master. Then when you get in the next morning, you can pull prod1 back up, and uh, it'll become a slave. Uh, and you can just go back and forth. If uh, prod2 crashes now, then prod1 will become master again. So um, we use slightly different terminology than master and slave for this, because uh, a master can become a slave and vice versa. So we just talk about the current master as the primary, and then the current slaves who could become master as secondary. And so you basically have a setup like you would with one math, like with master slave. Um, you have one primary and then a bunch of secondaries. And then you can also have passive servers, which can never become master. So if you just have a bunch of passive servers, uh, it's pretty much the same as having a master slave setup. You have to manually promote them to uh, being new masters. But passives can be handy because sometimes you just want a server that you can use for backup or something. So. Um, If we have this setup with uh, a, a master and a couple slaves, and then we, uh, sorry, the computer's kind of sticking a little when I try to change um, slides. But OK, so if the master goes down in this situation, then um, you can set different priorities for different slaves depending on how much you want them to become master if the current master dies. So whoever has the highest priority will become the new master. And right now there are only a couple priorities supported, but in the future it will be like any priority you want. Um, and so uh, if you have equal priorities and the master goes down, then the slaves will compare who is the most caught up and then whoever is the most caught up will become the new master. Um, and if everyone goes down, uh, the passive will still be able to take reads. Um, and in well, any Christina, case, you can I'm scale out the reads using the secondaries. The secondary. Yep. Chris, I'm oh, sorry to interrupt. A couple people are asking oh. if you would slow down just a little bit. So I think they're they're trying to take in everything you're saying. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, sure. No, that's OK. I'll try. OK, so um, the, these handle um, network partitions kind of interestingly, because um, network partitions handle happen all the time in real life. And uh, the problem with this auto, auto promotion of slaves to masters is you don't want to end up with two masters. Mongo tries to avoid this at uh, any cost, kind of, because if you end up with two masters, you can end up with conflicts. Um, a lot of people think that they want two masters, but then they don't want to deal with conflicts. So we just generally try to avoid ever having them. So let's say you, uh, it, the previous example was kind of simplified um, because Say you did have these two servers set up, and then you get a network partition. Then um, prod1 is going to think that prod2 is down, and prod2 is going to think that prod1 is down. So, um, But we don't want prod2 to assume mastership, because then someone could come along and try to do a write to prod2, and at the same time, do a conflicting write to prod1. And then both of these databases are going to be totally OK with doing this conflicting write, but um, when, because they don't know that the other one is doing it. So when the network partition is resolved, then one database is just going to clobber the other's data. Or if you're lucky and you're using a database that uh, is OK with conflicts, you're going to have to program yourself what to do in the case of any conflicts, which is kind of a pain. So 
MongoTrez did have just one master. And in case of network partition here, what would actually happen is um, that the current master would actually just be demoted and you'd end up with two slaves. So um, the way that replica sets work is that you need a majority of servers to elect a master. Um, each server casts a vote into a pool, and whichever server gets more than half of the votes um, becomes the new master. So here we've got two servers, two votes, so any server needs both votes to become master. So um, you often want an odd number of votes so that you can always have a master, because this is kind of a waste of resources. You can still read from either server, but you can't do any writes. So one way of alleviating this tie is you could add another server. Um, just add another slave to the replica set. Um, then you'll have two votes on the side, and so you'll be able to elect prod two or prod three as a master. And um, But uh, you do have to have some extra resources for that to be able to have um, another server going. And some people only want really one slave. So that's not a viable solution for some people, um, in which case you can, if it'll ever let me change slides, you can give extra votes to one of the servers. So um, you can say, OK, prod one can have of two votes. So now you've got a total of three votes in the system. Prod one can elect itself master, because it's two out of three votes. Um, and prod2 will never be able to, which works well in the case of uh, a network partition, but it doesn't work so well in the case of just the server going down. Because in this case, prod2 is up and healthy, and it won't be a multi-master situation, but it still can't elect itself because uh, prod1 had two votes. It only has one. is one out of three votes, so it can never become master. So the solution is to add in an arbiter, which is uh, just a voting process. It, you start it up like a normal database, but it doesn't hold any data, and it just sits around and votes. So uh, in the case of a network partition, whichever side of the partition it's on, um, in this case, it would be on the same side as prod2, so it would vote for prod2. Um, and then prod2 would be elected. Um, if it's on the other side, it would choose prod1, and prod1 would be elected. Um, in the case that the server just goes down, uh, it would still be able to see prod2 and see that it's up and healthy and it would be elect, it would elect prod 2. So um, the thing with getting data from slaves is I said you could scale out reads like this, but um, you're getting, you might be getting old data, like uh, slaves pull the data from the master, and so the data that you get from them can be kind of out of date. Um, so one of the ways you can fix this with Mongo is you can say, um, Change slides, OK. Um, you can say, change slides. And it'll change slides. And then you can, uh, you can just, so uh, if you're using a normal database and you give it uh, something to insert, a write to do, the database will do the write and say, OK. Um, but if the database then crashes, you have no idea if the slaves got the write or not. Um, so. Mongo has a thing where you can say, make sure that at least n slaves have this operation before you tell me that it worked. So that way, you can do an, a write operation and then rest easy knowing that it'll replicate it to at least that many servers before it returns OK. And then it'll finish replicating to the rest of the servers because you end up with an identical copy of the data on all the servers. Um, so if the master goes down before it's managed to do the write, um, replicate the write, uh, then you'll get a nice big exception, um, and the mastership will change. And then you can handle the exception and redo the write. So replica sets give you read scaling. Uh, you can keep adding new slaves as you need more read capability. You got automatic failover. You can uh, just leave it and let it let the master fail, and a slave will become master. Um, 
and then uh, well, sorry, just sort of reset my screen. Um, and then you can also do this configurable consistency where you choose a number of writes uh, that it does. So before we get into the sharding, which I will cover, um, just about optimizing your application to scale, scale well. You can picture your application as like, or your database as a book. Um, if you are doing a write, it's like you're writing a new, chat, a new uh, paragraph at the end, say. Um, if you're doing a read, it's like you're looking through the book to find whatever your query is and then reading that paragraph. Um, and so if you picture it that way, um, you've got this whole huge book of information on disk and you've got this tiny little bit of RAM. And so every time you want to access read, write any information, you pull out the relevant page of the book and you put it in RAM. And so uh, as you need other pages, you just uh, fill up your RAM with different pages from the book. Um, once RAM's full, though, uh, in order to get another page, you need to swap whatever was in RAM out and put the new page in. Um, and always ac accessing disk is really expensive, so you want to avoid that as much as possible and really stick to just accessing the information that's already in RAM. So the basic goal, and this isn't really Mongo specific, it's just databases in general, is uh, minimize the amount you're switching in and out of memory. So a good way to do this is figure out what's the access pattern to your data. Uh, for a lot of web applications, that's going to be recent data. Uh, most people are going to look at things that are like from the last week or two. To. They're not going to care about older stuff. And you might want to run batch jobs on it, but that's less of a real-time thing, and so you don't have to worry about that. You just have to keep a certain amount of time in memory. So if you only ever have to access the last week and you can fit the last 10 days of data in memory, um, you can kind of scale on this machine forever until you run out of disk. Um, and one thing to mention with this memory stuff is that uh, Mongo is really meant to be run in a setup like this. Um, if you're running it on your desktop um, and you're opening other applications and stuff, uh, it'll work. But, um, you know, these other applications are uh, more sticky about the memory that they use than Mongo, so they'll just kick out the Mongo memory it's using and make Mongo a lot slower. So it'll work, but it'll be slower on a non-server kind of environment. Okay, and then a uh, big key to making things fast is uh, the first step is really to get your indexes right. Um, and creating an index for a database is really very, very similar to creating an index for a book. If you want to look up something fast in a big book, you look at the index and you just scroll down until you find what you're looking for and uh, jump to that page. In a database, you say what field you want to index, like the name field for people, and Mongo will create a list of all the people. Well, it's actually a tree, but we'll pretend it's a list because you can picture it better. Um, but it's basically like an alphabetical list of all the people's names. Um, and then each of these will, instead of a page number, has a pointer back to where the data actually is. So um, now if Mongo needs to access something in the index, it just has to switch out a much smaller piece of memory because the index is always a lot smaller than the whole book is going to be. Um, and then you can also have a name, instead of going from A to Z, say, uh, you can create an index that's descending, which will go from Z to A. Um, and it, since you all know alphabetical order, you know that A to Z is just as easy to find as Z to A. Um, so these indexes are completely equivalent. Um, the only time when they stop being equivalent, ascending and descending, is when you have a compound index. So you can create an index on multiple fields. Um, to really quickly do queries on name and age fields. Uh, so in this case, it would sort things by name ascending, so Aaron to Adam, and then age descending from 39 to 37. Um, so it's basically like when you do sort. Um, and if you notice, when we create this name field, this name and age index, we also get included a name index. 
Um, so there's no need to create a separate index on name. A lot of people have sort of redundant indexes because they don't realize this. Um, and But you don't, if you notice here, you don't get an index on age. There's no way to get sort of uh, find a particular person's age really fast um, about their name as well. So age isn't really part of this. Um, in general, if you have an index on X, Y, Z, W, you're going to um, also have an implicit index on X, Y, Z, X, Y, and X. So you always get the prefix um, index of what you created. So you don't need to create any of those as well, because it'll just be a waste of space. So, so you can pretty efficiently cover a query like that. So how do you know what indexes you actually need? Um, Mongo has a neat tool where it'll profile all your queries for you. It basically monitors all the queries that you're doing and uh, saves information about what they were, when they happened, how long they took. So uh, if you run this command in the Mongo shell, you can um, set, uh, you can query all, you can profile all queries. Um, if you do, you can set to a lower level. This will just profile queries that are longer than 50 milliseconds. So gives you some flexibility because it does slow down your system, um, you know, keeping track of all the queries it's doing. So, you know, a good way of doing this is to create a mock-up of what your database is going to be, um, or hopefully actually what your database is going to be, and then run some sample load data, some sample runtime data against it, um, see what some sample traffic looks like, and then look at the system profile collection, which will give you a list of all the queries you did, how long they took, um, and give you some nice fodder for what's taking a long time, what really should be indexed. Um, some people start out and they index everything because they hear the indexes will make things fast. But uh, this will make your database huge. It'll make inserts it's really slow because if you imagine when you're inserting something, um, every index has to write an entry in the correct place for that insert. So um, every index you have is going to slow down inserts and removes and updates um, quite a bit. So you want to minimize the number of indexes you have. Um, and then once you have your indexes and you've choos chosen judicious, judicious ones, then you want to make sure that they're actually being used by your queries. So Mongo has a feature very similar to a relational database where you can run and explain on your queries. And it'll let you know uh, what kind of uh, cursor is being used, whether or not it's using an index on that query. And it has a query optimizer and stuff, too, to choose. If you have multiple indexes that could be used on a query, uh, hopefully it'll choose the best one. And if it doesn't, you can hint it to use the right one. OK, and then probably what people are looking forward to is uh, how did you sharding. So if you have a single database, and uh, you want to scale it, you can either scale up or you can scale out. Um, scaling up is really easy. You just get a bigger machine. Um, and the problem is it's very expensive. Uh, they don't exactly increase linearly in price to features. Um, and it's also kind of limited. You can't just keep getting bigger machines. Um, so the way people prefer to scale is scale out. You divide up your data and you spread it out across commodity hardware. When you run out of space, you just get another piece of commodity hardware and hopefully you can just throw it at the problem and uh, keep scaling out your system as you need. So that's the goal. Um, so a lot of people start out with a single instance of Mongo and then they want to know when should they actually add more machines. Um, it's probably either when you run out of disk space or you need more writes per second because sharding is really good. It'll scale reads, but it'll also scale writes, which replica sets can't do. Um, so, but there's a big asterisk here, which um, is that you really should be happy with your system. Um, it doesn't actually need to be perfect. No system is perfect, but um, you shouldn't scale, you shouldn't shard a system that you're already having problems with. There's um, a quote that uh, when people have a problem 
and they try to use a regular expression, now they have two problems. It's the same thing with uh, sharding. If you have a problem on one server, like uh, your schema isn't right, or you cho chose the wrong indexes, it's really not going to help much to throw another machine at the problem. Now you just have more to monitor, more can go wrong. Um, there's more problems. So, so before you shard, you should make sure you're fairly happy with your setup. Make sure that you've gotten one single instance of Mongo working. Some people don't. Um, put some data in it. Learn about what indexes you should have. Play around with it. Uh, get replica sets working. And then finally, you can shard. Um, but try not to jump the gun on it. So how sharding actually works. Um, if you have a document in Mongo, basically, it, just as an example, say it's like person's information, and you have a couple fields, including a name field. Um, then your collection is like a bunch of documents with name fields, um, just tons of them. And so when you enable sharding, um, you choose a field to shard on. I'm choosing the name field. And uh, Mongo will take that collection, and it'll start dividing into chunks, like one chunk with names starting A through F. Um, and then another chunk with names G through M, and another chunk with names N through T and U through Z. Um, so these chunks are actually going to be uh, starting at negative infinity and ending at positive infinity. But since it's alphabetical, it's uh, just um, going to be A to F, probably, and U to Z. But uh, you can shard on any value, so it has to go from the smallest possible value of any type to the largest possible value of any type. So anyway, you've got all these chunks, and they're on a single server. And then you're going to add another server if you're sharding. Um, and what Mongo does, uh, what makes this nice, is that it automatically figures out, based on what's in memory, how, what you're hitting on um, your single machine, uh, which chunks are kind of hot and should be moved to a new machine to balance out uh, the load. And uh, so a lot of people try out sharding, and uh, they want to see all their data flying around. Um, and unfortunately, Mongo programmed, is programmed to make this kind of boring, because chunks are huge by default. You have to get hundreds of megabytes before it'll start making chunks. And it moves things around really slowly. It'll, uh, it doesn't want on in production, you to have this really hot machine that's getting pounded, and then you pull up another server to relieve the pressure, and it starts pounding the hot machine and just brings it down. So Mongo's really conservative about moving chunks around. Um, it does have a setting for people to just try out and play with um, sharding, where you can uh, set chunk size to be really, really small, so you can get tons of chunks and see them moving around, and uh, it's fun. But in production, it's kind of boring to watch. So uh, eventually, it will just balance these out, assuming you have fairly equal access to all the information in the chunks. And you'll end up with half of your information on one server and half of it on the other. Um, and then as you add data, it'll add it to the existing chunks. And then when they get too big, the chunks will split in two. Um, and it'll rebalance them if it needs to, if one shard is getting uh, more data than the other. So the point of sharding is to have this just be a big black box. Your um, application shouldn't need to know that uh, it's talking to anything more than one server. So to do that, we put a router in front of them. And so you can just talk to this router like it was a single Mongo process. You query it and say, I want some information. And it knows where all your data is, where all the chunks are. It basically holds all the metadata. And so it can route it to the correct shard. Um, so uh, then um, when the, sh the shard will just execute the query and send the information back to the router, and the router will send it back to you. Um, and so then if it needs to, it'll send it to all the shards or some subset of the shards. And then uh, the router will do any sorts or aggregations or whatever that finally need to be done. And then it'll send it back to you. Um, and then if you do an insert, it'll look at the shard key in the document you're inserting and route that insert to the correct shard. So a lot of people ask when they start out sharding, uh, what's a good shard key? And this depends a lot on your queries and uh, what your data storage, what you want to use for your data storage. Um, 
a lot of people want like an even distribution. So you could use something like username. Uh, people creating new users are um, going to choose pretty random usernames. It's not going to be any particular pattern. So you'll get inserts across all your shards. Um, it'll just go to some random chunk. But you could also choose something like date, um, created at, modified at. Um, and then it'll be sort of a strictly ascending kind of thing. Um, because the date is always increasing. And uh, so you'll have this one chunk that has the most recent uh, data on it from some time to infinity. And uh, all your data will get placed there as you insert it. Um, and then so once that chunk gets too big, it'll be divided into two chunks, uh, like yesterday until 9, and then a, small, uh, a new chunk that's 9 to infinity. Um, and then that chunk will start growing as you insert more. Um, and people actually do ask for this. This will mean that all of your data is basically wrapped to one shard, but some people have like one monster machine, and then they want to just gradually siphon off other information to other machines. I don't know. And then another thing is using Booleans, uh, or fields without that much variation in value um, as a shard key, which a lot of people try to do. Um, the problem is, like, say you have a Boolean value. It's either true or false. You're going to, I mean, Mongo divides up chunks based on the value. So you're going to end up just with two chunks, one for all the false values and one for all the true values. And these are just going to get bigger and bigger. And Mongo can't split them. So a good thing to do in this case is to do a compound shard key and combine it with another field that is going to change. And then Mongo can split these things up better um, and manage them for you. So actually setting this up. Uh, remember that replication is basically like copies of the data, and sharding is like you're dividing up the data so and moving it among multiple machines. So we're going to combine these two things so we get lots of copies of our data and uh, be able to split it across multiple machines. So you're going to start out with a replica set. We recommend that everyone be running a replica set in production. Um, So you start out with your replica set uh, with, call it foo. And uh, then when you want to make it into sharding, you just start up a router process somewhere. And you tell that router process, add this replica set as a shard. Um, it'll configure all the metadata it needs and figure things out. Um, and then you can still be, at this point, uh, reading and writing from the replica set. And then when you want to switch over to sharding, you can start talking to the router instead. Um, and then when you want to add another, um, uh, when foo becomes overloaded, you need more processing power, you need more space, you can add another replica set and just tell the router, OK, add this new replica set as a shard. And it'll add into the cluster. And I'm just going to compact these down to save space. But um, you can just keep doing this as you need more, uh, more insert power, more disk space. You can just keep adding replica sets and uh, expanding your cluster. So a lot of people look at this, and they think that the router is probably a single point of failure. Um, it's actually not. Um, we recommend actually having a router on every application server that you have. Um, it's uh, that way you can have your application server talk to this local machine. So it's a very short network hop. And then um, if the whole machine goes down, no one's trying to talk to a router that's not there. Um, so that works out well. Um, and so you can have tons of those. And they are fairly lightweight. They occasionally have to do a merge sort, but uh, it's not too bad. And so the goal is you know, to make this. Um, opaque to the application. This is how you connect to a single server using the shell. And this is how you connect to a routing process connected to a cluster. And you do the exact same operations on a cluster as you would to a single Mongo instance or a replica set. It's um, supposed to be uh, just a completely invisible process to the application. So you can just build your application and then scale it out as it needs to scale out. That's sort of the overall goal. Um, and then someone, uh, at the risk of associating us with the, um, the empire, 
Um, I thought that that tweet kind of expressed it well. It's pretty cool just being able to keep adding more power and uh, more computation or computational ability to your cluster as you need. So um, if this seemed interesting at all, um, I hope that you guys will go to mongodb.org and uh, try it out, download the software. Um, you can try it out pretty easily. There's documentation on setting it all up. Um, I didn't want to go through the actual commands because it's like, whatever, it's a couple lines of bash. You can uh, copy and paste it from the documentation. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this. And now I guess I'll take some questions. Hey, Christina, Catherine here. That was that was great. Can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I think uh, we have a little yes, time can. lag. So, it, it, okay, I think we're having a little time lag here. So it might be better better if you read the questions yourself. Now you can see we have a million questions over here. So why don't you scroll down and pick the ones <laughs> okay, you think uh, I'll try to kind of talk about. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so, okay, so the automatic, uh, Dennis asks, where does this automatic thing happen? I don't see anything that would let me define a set in the PHP driver. Um, you should check your documentation for like driver specific stuff, but generally you specify set name slash and then one or more servers in the set, and then your uh, driver will automatically detect all of the servers in the set. It'll detect new ones as they come up, and it'll switch over automatically to uh, the new primary if a new primary comes up. Um, let's see. How does voting work? Who votes for who? Or is voting based on some poor priority? Um, I think I sort of covered that, but um, it's, uh, oh, sorry, that was Sasank Ready. Um, and so uh, voting works by, um, I'm not sure of the exact uh, protocols and whatever that we use, but um, it's basically all the servers in the cluster get together and um, and uh, decide on the new master. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can look at the co code actually for that. It's kind of interesting. Um, let's see, how do the... Uh, let's see, the official C driver, um, I think it's being, oh, sorry. Uh, Henning Anderson says, when will the official C, C Sharp driver be available? Um, the uh, Tenjin is creating a kind of a officially supported C, C Sharp driver. Um, and it's being tested by a few people at the moment. I think it will be available very soon for people uh, within a month, I'm sure. Um, how does the replicated database know who is the master? Um, they all keep in, in uh, communication with each other. Um, they have this heartbeat thing which goes out so they know who's up and they basically keep a running status of who's master, who's secondary, who arbiters are, who the passes are. Everyone has a complete record of what's going on in the set so that they can update that. Uh, let's see. What? Um, Vince Tis asks, is it possible to determine which slaves must have committed data before a write is considered successful? For example, I have a local slave in the same location as the master and a remote slave. When I write, I want to make sure that the local slave has the data before the write is considered successful. Um, it's not possible at the moment. Um, I think in the next version or two, we're going to be adding a feature to have um, the, uh, when you say replicate this to n slaves, it'll uh, replicate it to the highest priority slaves first. So you'll just be able to set the highest priority slaves to have the information. Um, and then do, and then it'll trickle down to the lower priority slaves. Um, 
Bowden Q asks, any information on the Rebull driver? Uh, from my point of view, language fits NoSQL idea perfectly. Um, I have no idea what Rebull is. Sorry. <laughs> um, if someone can clarify that, uh, that would be good. Um, can a query, Josh asks, can a query be filled with just an index without ever hitting the data? And yes, it absolutely can. Um, and that is, as you'd imagine, very, very fast. Um, if you can, in Mongo, you can limit, you know, the result set to just certain fields. And if uh, index completely covers your query, then uh, you can, uh, that's fantastic. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't happen a ton, but sometimes it does. Um, Ian Patton asks how to back up a sharded setup. Um, you, uh, there are a couple different ways of backing up stuff in Mongo. Um, you, each shard is a replica set, as you saw. Um, so you can take backups from the slaves in the replica set. Um, I believe you can take a dump of the entire cluster. Um, actually, you probably can't. You can probably take a dump from each, uh, each shard. Um, is probably the best way to do it. So, um, You'd probably do that. Uh, let's see. I did the PHP driver, so I'm sort of favoring the PHP questions. But uh, Jesse Hernandez asks, using the PHP driver, how do you specify that you want to access one of the slaves for read-only queries as opposed to write queries? Oh, um, so right now you have to do this manually. Um, it's kind of annoying, but we're going to be fixing it. Um, you connect to the master, and then you issue an is master command which returns a complete set of who's in this who's in the um, who's in the replica set so then you find the slaves you connect to them and you send the read queries to them but we're just gonna set it so if we're gonna change it in all the drivers um, that if you set slave okay then you can just issue a command and it'll be routed to one of the slaves um, and, you know, you have to be okay with having the uh, uh, possibly older data, but that way you can just distribute your reads automatically to the other slaves. But it's not there yet, but it should be in the next couple of weeks. Um, John Woolman asks, would you want to shard on, on underscore ID key? Um, and uh, you could. This is uh, an ID. Um, well, the ID field could be any value that you want. By default, it's a special type called object ID. Um, so if it is an object ID, the object IDs start with a timestamp. So it's very similar, actually, to sharding on a date field. Um, so you, you, it's basically the same characteristics as that. And then, of course, if you have your own custom underscore ID field, um, then it might have any characteristics. I have no idea. But you shard on it in the exact same way you would any other field. Um, are chunks replicated between MongoDB instances? So yeah, if you have um, a replica set as a shard, all of the chunks in that shard will be replicated to all the members of that replica set. Um, how does the routing process scale? Um, well, you can add multiple routers. Um, that's really how it scales um, at the moment, um, is just adding more routers. Um, Vinet Siegel asks, what happens if one of the replica, replica slaves is behind due to load? Does it stop all replication? So um, if one of the replica slaves gets very, very far behind, uh, there's sort of this like fixed size slave needs to apply, um, and it pulls this collection down from the master. And so it just goes through this list and um, applies them on the slave. Um, and so uh, if it gets so behind that the master has completely recycled this collection by the time the slave gets there and it, the slave is um, missing operations, kind of, um, then the slave will halt uh, replication, it'll say, I'm too behind. Um, however, all the other slaves are unaffected because everyone's just pulling from the master. Um, let's see. Uh, Justin Deering says, what about uh, collisions, uh, case sensitivity, Unicode, and all that? Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Um,
but sorry, uh, if someone wants to clarify. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, sorting. Um, I mean, it's a string compare, so uh, if it, it'll be the same as that. Um, you can make it not case sensitive by making everything lowercase. Um, that's the recommended solution right now. Um, if I'm running, make L says if I'm running frequent MapReduce jobs, sharding is recommended because MapReduce is single threaded with the latest version. Is this right? Um, it's true. Uh, unfortunately, the JavaScript engine we're using, and it seems like every freaking JavaScript engine in the world, is single threaded. Um, and they're all really bad at dealing with multiple threads. Um, the thing is, JavaScript is just kind of slow, because uh, uh, Mongo doesn't actually store the stuff in JavaScript. It has to pull out its native format, turn it into JavaScript, run your JavaScript, and then store it back as Mongo's native format. So it's just kind of a slow process. Um, we're actually working on a Hadoop plugin for it, so that'll be nice. You'll just be able to, you know, write a Hadoop job, send it to something that's actually really good at MapReduce, and, uh, you know, get back your results. But for now, um, yeah, sharding is good as kind of a, a standby because it's, um, it'll distribute the MapReduce load over a lot of servers, but in general, just JavaScript is going to be slow. Um, Let's see. If they sync up, asked Gerard Pascal. Um, the routers actually, um, it, I kind of skimmed over how uh, they store data, but uh, they have these configuration servers that um, they get their information from and store it to. And the configuration servers are actually the one part of MongoDB that uses two-phase commit. So all these uh, configuration servers communicate with each other, make sure they all have absolutely consistent, up-to-date uh, uh, data about the metadata of your sharding. Um, and then when you start up a new routing process, it just pulls the uh, configuration from these servers. Um, Kurt Kalavazin asks, I'm sorry about the names, guys. Um, is there a concept of atomic transactions in MongoDB? If not, how would you do it? Um, so you can do atomic operations on a single document. Uh, they either happen or they don't happen. So if two people are pushing a comment to the end of an array, say, um, you know, one will go first and one will go second. You're never going to clobber one person's data with another. They're atomic operations. However, you can't do multi-document uh, transactions. Um, and if you do, uh, and if you do like a bunch of updates, you know, if you wanted to push an element to uh, 50 arrays and 50 documents, each of those individual things will be atomic. But um, someone pointed out it's not atomic altogether, it's um, isolated. Um, Hey, Christina. So each one of them is atomic, but if it's half related, it's the like. Oh, I'm sorry. Your 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 voice cut out for a moment. So I just Hello? want to make sure you were still there, but you are. Car Carry on. Oh, okay. Um. Okay. Uh, how do we sort uncharted data? What's the overhead? So this is actually kind of a cool thing. Um, we out all the shards. And
And, uh, or, so it, it kind of varies to what shards or index real shards. And then it pulls back the results. And it just pulls back like the first couple of results from each shard um, to the router. And then the router does like a merge sort um, from all the results from all the shards. Christina? Christina, I don't know if you can hear me. It's Catherine here. For some reason, your audio is cutting out Shards. suddenly. And so it only has to pull a few oh. results at a time for index. Uh, so, you, should, you know, we try to abstract. Christina? This, uh, yeah. Christina? I'm sorry, everyone. We seem to be having some, all of a sudden, some latency issues here. So, um, I'm thinking maybe we should wrap it up. Um, because I, I can't hear Christina talking. Her audio is cutting out. Can you hear me talking? Yes? Hello? Okay, okay. I want to make sure. Christina, your voice keeps cutting out, and I think we're having some uh, latency problems all of a sudden. So we should probably wrap up. Now, there are a lot of questions left unanswered. And I, I'm wondering, do you have a blog where you could answer these questions? You can type in the chat room. If well, we're out of time anyway. So I'll, I'll say this. Um, let's just thank you, Christina, for a fabulous uh, look at MongoDB and scaling with it. It was, uh, please, it was really wonderful. And people are saying, please answer on your blog. So I'll send you the questions. And you can answer on your blog, and we'll get um, we'll get copies of it there. We will have a recording of this webcast, and I'll send everyone a link to the recording as soon as it's available. That should be um, probably it'll probably be early next week because uh, we're a little backed up today. So we'll get that out to you. And then I do want to remind you that Christina's book it is the definitive guide. She um, is one of the authors of it. It just came out, and she'll have the book available. I mean, it's available now. You can get that. Um, we have that discount code forecast. It's good for 40% off the book, 50% off eBooks on O'Reilly.com. And we ask you to please help support our free. Sorry, I keep saying this. I sound like a broken record, but I really do encourage you to please help support our free webcast program so we can keep it going by by buying a book. So thanks, everyone. And thank you, Christina. So I'm going to close out the chat room in just a minute. We had a great group today. It was really fun. So thanks, everyone.